When Ramesh Januzi got kicked out of his family home, he went onto Airbnb and found the cheapest place that he could and booked it for a few nights. Little did he know that booking would cost him his life. So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about the Airbnb murder. But before we get into it, I do just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible, Word Farm Adventure. Word Farm Adventure has been one of my go-to mobile games, and you guys know what I'm like with my mobile games. I love a good mobile game. It's been one of my favourites for like two years now, and you can download it for free on iOS and Android using the link down below in the description. So in Word Farm Adventure, Adventure. You basically get to complete crossword puzzles, word scrabble missions. It's like a word game. Loads of different word games. It's a great way to challenge your brain in a fun way. And honestly, that's the only way I want to challenge my brain is if it's fun. And as you rise through the levels, you are tasked with restoring and rebuilding an old farm and a villa, which is honestly one of my favorite parts of the game. I love a good design element to a game. There's so many ways for you to customize these locations and make them really unique and fun and as you do complete more levels you unlock more things about these locations that you can customize. I just love how unique Word Farm Adventure is. Like a word game and a design game in one. It's like a combo made in heaven. <laughs> but I'm not even gonna lie, one of my favorite things to do on this game is change the little in-game letter tiles. You can change the design behind them and trust me I'm doing this like every week. I currently have some turkey tiles on. They look like turkeys and it makes me laugh every single time I see it but one of my favorites is the galaxy ones. I always seem to go back to the galaxy ones. So if you wanna join me on Word Farm Adventure, you can download the game for free using the link down below in the description or you can scan the QR code that's on screen right now. Thanks again to Word Farm Adventure for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I do just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Just a couple of content warnings before we do get into the case. Today we're going to be talking about themes of domestic and child abuse, drug addiction and rape. So if any of those are things that you feel like you can't listen to right now, I completely understand. Click out of the video and please look after yourself. I'm sure I can see you again at some other point with a different video. All that being said, Let's get into the case. So today's case takes place in Australia, a place called Brighton East in Melbourne in 2017. And there was an Airbnb that was owned by three men, or at least there were three other men that lived in that house and then they rented out their fourth bedroom on Airbnb. So let me introduce you to these three Airbnb hosts, the first of which was the youngest one. His name was Craig Levy and he was 36 years old. He was a chef at a restaurant and that's pretty much all he really had going on in his life. He didn't have any like significant relationships, a girlfriend, anything like that. Well, not that we know of. There was really not much going on in his life. He was just living with his two mates in this house. So that brings us on to the second of the men, the middle oldest. He was just one year older than Craig. So pretty much the same age. This guy's name was Ryan Smart. Ryan had quite a traumatic upbringing. He had an alcoholic father who actually ended up abandoning him. So then he was left with his mother who was also an alcoholic. And not only that, she was also a dependent on a lot of different drugs as well, hard drugs. So Ryan never really had like a stable, healthy, safe, family life ever. His mother could barely look after Ryan and his siblings. And actually at one point, I think his older sister got sectioned under the Mental Health Act. She was sent to a psychiatric hospital. And when she was released from the hospital, I think she was actually put into care because she was reviewed and it was deemed that it wasn't a safe household for her to go back to. I don't know why the social services didn't also take her other siblings when they, you know, put her into care, because clearly if it's not safe for the sister, then it's not safe for Ryan or any other siblings that he might have. I don't know if he had any more. So anyway, this left Ryan alone with his mother. His sister was now gone and he was raised by his mother until his teenage years when she was actually so dependent on these drugs that she was put into a care home. So now Ryan just had to go out into the world and, and try and build his own life. He had to go out there and be independent and he really wasn't ready to do that. And 
it it really showed because he couldn't keep a job he couldn't keep a group of friends he just wasn't he wasn't old enough to be able to do this he had a very sad life actually and he ended up falling into a lot of drug dependencies just like his parents had most notably he was doing meth ecstasy lsd alcohol and cannabis most days that sounds terrifying. So that was Ryan. And then the third of these Airbnb hosts, the oldest of all of them was 41 year old Jason Colton. And Jason was quite unlike the other two. Well, at least his life started off very differently from the other ones, or at least from Ryan's. He had a really, really good upbringing. I think he went to private school. He had a very healthy, happy family. He came from a very good home, did Jason. He never really had an issue in his whole entire life. That was until he got into his 20s. He met a Norwegian woman in Australia, I think, and they moved back to Norway together and they actually had a son over there. But this is when the problems began because Jason quickly became a very abusive partner to this woman and he was dangerous around their child. And it wasn't even just with his partner and his child. He just became a very angry, violent person in general. He was getting into bar fights, street fights. He was getting arrested. He was actually sent to court four different times while he lived over in Norway. And I don't know exactly how long he lived there, but it really wasn't for that long. And the worst of these four violent incidents was when Jason did a completely unprovoked violent attack on his housemate while they were asleep. He literally just went into this guy's bedroom while he was asleep in bed, grabbed hold of his throat and just started beating him over the head, just punching him in the head. This guy was completely defenseless. He didn't know it was coming. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't protect himself. He just, I don't know why this happened. I don't know why he attacked him as he was sleeping, but for this, he got into some big trouble. He was sentenced to five months in prison over in Norway. And then after that, he was actually deported back to Australia. And I don't think he ever saw his, his girlfriend or his child ever again. So quite a friend group we've got here with these three Airbnb hosts. It was a very, very turbulent household that they lived in and that they brought other people in through Airbnb. I don't know exactly the kind of stuff that would go on in this house day to day, but I know there was drugs in there often. There was violence around the house. Police would always be round at the house for some reason or another, no matter what it was theft, you know, these men were always getting into some kind of trouble. But despite their lives being so unwelcoming, the men thought it would be a good idea to rent out their fourth bedroom on Airbnb and bring other people into this mess. Because it was just one bedroom, it wasn't like a, an entire place, the people were booking like a house share, that meant it was really quite cheap. I think it was about $30 a night. So this meant that it would book up quite often and quite quickly because everyone's always looking for a cheap, a cheap deal on Airbnb. However, every single person that came to stay in this fourth bedroom hated it. The men had absolutely awful reviews on the website. And I think even a few guests had complained to Airbnb about, about their experience. I actually have a couple of quotes from guest reviews. One person said they felt unsafe, uncomfortable, and even had property stolen, presumably by one of the hosts, because who else is gonna be in that house? Imagine being an Airbnb host and stealing from your guest. Another person's review said, better way to spend the night would be to buy a $50 hammer, smash your hand with it, and then go to the emergency hospital. So if that doesn't speak for itself when it comes to the, the general energy and the hospitality of this Airbnb, then I don't know what will. It literally seemed like hell on earth for people. In October of 2017, the men accepted yet another booking for their fourth bedroom. It was a man named Ramis Januzzi, and he wanted to stay there for three nights. Ramis Januzzi was was 36 years old and he'd just come out of an eight year relationship with a man that I believe cheated on him. So he's going through a lot at this point in his life. If that wasn't bad enough, after the breakdown of this relationship, I believe he lived with his partner. So then he had to move out of that situation and he moved back in with his parents, which was quite a step back for a man in his thirties that had had his own place for a significant amount of time. So all of these different factors in his life, getting over this breakup, moving back in with his parents, Parents, feeling like he's kind of going backwards in life, Ramis got addicted to a lot of drugs. He was taking these drugs to kind of like numb himself, take himself out of the stress and the situation that he was in. 
And it only ended up causing more problems for him because now he was dependent on a lot of different things. At one point, his sister actually dragged him to the hospital to get him some help for these dependencies. But those were only a few of a whole host of problems in Ramis Januzzi's life. At some point, he actually ended up sleeping in his car because I think he was kicked out of his parents' house due to all of these drug dependencies, addictions. It was affecting his behavior. He was becoming hard to live with. So now he is sleeping in his car, he's getting over this breakup still, he's falling out with his own family, he's dependent on all these drugs, everything is just crumbling around him right now. And now he's practically homeless, so he needed somewhere cheap to stay and he needed to find it fast. So he went to Airbnb and he found this place in Brighton East. It was a spare bedroom in this guy's house for $30 a night. And so he thought, okay, perfect. So he booked it for three nights and then he went down to the property to go and meet his three new temporary housemates, Ryan Smart, Craig Levy, and Jason Colton. Immediately, as soon as he kind of went into this house and got settled, Ramis Januzzi felt the bad energy of this household. It was very hostile. It just wasn't a nice place to be, but he really didn't have any other option right now. This was the cheapest place he could find and he was desperate. So he decided to just ride it out. It was only gonna be for three nights. So a little into his three day stay, Ramis found himself confiding in Craig about his current situation. You know, that he really doesn't have much money, his life is crumbling around him and he's really desperate for any kind of help that he can get. He said he really didn't have anywhere to go once his time was up in this Airbnb. And so he started begging Craig Levy to let him stay there longer for free. Craig was reluctant to let him stay. Obviously they wanted money if he's gonna be staying there, otherwise they could rent it out to someone else who was gonna pay. They really didn't wanna let this guy stay there for free. But then Ramis showed Craig his bank balance on his phone, like on his online banking app, and he had $6 in his account. He was literally like begging on his knees for Craig to let him stay there for free. Eventually, Craig actually gave in and he told Ramis that he could stay there until the end of the week, but then he had to be out because they wanted another renter in that room. So Ramis was relieved and another maybe two days go by and then Craig Levy changes his mind. He told Ramis that he wanted him to pay for all the nights that he'd stayed, even the ones that he said that he could have for free. And so Ramis was saying, well, I've, I've got $6. I've literally shown you my bank balance. He even got it out again, showed him a second time. He still only had $6 in there. But Craig didn't care. Even though he physically saw that Ramis would not be able to pay for this, Craig was still demanding this money. By now, Ramis owed around $200, maybe $210, because he'd stayed there for about a week at this point. So that was way more than he ever intended on paying, he now owes these men double what he would have owed them before. So now it was October 25th, 2017, and Craig decided to go and confront Ramis and get this money and get him out of the house. He told Ramis that if he wasn't gonna pay, if he couldn't pay, then he had to leave then and there. And somehow I think Ramis managed to, I don't know, stall a little bit longer. He managed to get a few more hours in that house. So you can imagine the kind of environment that that is currently going on in this Airbnb. It is very, very hostile. The hosts do not want him there, but Ramis has no other choice. He has nothing else that he can do other than go and sleep on the street. He was literally begging on like an hourly basis. These men would keep coming back to him and keep saying, pay or leave. And he would have to beg them like every hour to let him stay a tiny bit longer. And these men knew how badly he needed it as well, but they didn't care. Like Ramis was telling them if, if he couldn't stay there, he would be out on the street. He wouldn't have a roof over his head. He wouldn't be able to pay for any food. These men just didn't care though. And actually earlier that day on October 25th, all three men, Craig, Ryan, and Jason had all agreed that today was the day that they were getting their renter out of the house. Ramis had to be out by midnight that night. And they wanted the money as well. Not only did they want him to leave, they also wanted that 200 and some dollars and they weren't gonna take no for an answer. So at about 6 p.m. that night, Ryan and Jason both went to the pub, leaving Craig and Ramis at home by themselves. And Craig was tasked with having to get Ramis out 
by himself. So he went over and he confronted him and he said, pay and leave. He tried a few times actually over the period of a few hours. Craig was just in his bedroom playing Xbox that night and every so often he would like pause the game and go and harass Ramis to pay and to leave. At one point during the night, Jason actually texts Craig for an update on the situation and Craig texts back saying he's getting somewhere but stalling. Ramis was taking a long time to like pack up his things, tidy the room, so much so that Craig thought he was taking the mic, like he thought he was doing it on purpose, which only made him even angrier. Finally, when Ramis was done packing, he walked into Craig's room and he told him that he was done and he wanted Craig to go and check his bedroom that he'd tidied to make sure that it was like up to their standards before he left. So Craig went and had a look at this bedroom and it was fine. It was pretty much in the same condition it was when Ramis had got there. So that was gonna be it. Craig turned to Ramis and he asked for the keys back that they'd given him at the beginning. And that was when Ramis went quiet. He said he didn't have the keys anymore and he confessed to Craig that a couple of days prior, he'd actually been arrested by police. I think he was out on the street doing drugs. He'd been taken back to a holding cell and had his keys taken off of him. So the key for the Airbnb was currently at the police station, which only made Craig 10 times more angry that this lodger that they didn't even like, that they were trying to get out of the house, had now lost their key. Now they wouldn't even be able to rent out that fourth bedroom until they could get another key cut or until they went down to the police station to go and pick it up, which they weren't gonna do because these three men hated the police. Well, I mean, they were quite big criminals themselves. So like, why would they go to the police station and ask for a key? It was just another reason for all three men to be angry at Ramis Januzzi that he had now messed up their business that they were running from their house. So now Craig starts flying off the hand he is screaming at Ramis to pay what he owes. Obviously he still didn't have it. He hadn't been paid at this point. And so Ramis said that he was gonna go outside and call his boss and beg him to pay him early so that he would have some money to give these men. However, it was quite late at night by now. And I don't think his boss was picking up the phone or if he did, he wasn't willing to wire over the money at this time of night. It was about 8 PM. So Ramis went back inside the house unsuccessful, you know, he didn't have the money to give these men. And by now, Jason and Ryan were home from the pub. Ryan was upstairs in his bedroom, but Craig and Jason were sat in the living room and Ramis walks in there. And Jason was waiting for Ramis in that living room. He, there's a reason he didn't go up to his bedroom because he was more angry than Craig. As soon as Ramis came back in the house, Jason started screaming at him, swearing, calling him names, demanding that he paid. But I really don't know what these men expected. I mean, they physically saw his bank balance multiple times, saw that it had $6 in it. I really don't know where they expected him to actually get the money from. Like, I understand that they're mad, but no amount of shouting is gonna make money appear in this man's bank account. So the screaming continued and Jason is getting like right up in Ramis's face, really intimidating him. He's getting more and more riled up until supposedly, according to Jason, Ramis gave him a dirty look. And this is when all hell broke loose. With that, Jason lunged forward, got Ramis in a headlock and started beating him over the head, physically attacking him now. It took about five seconds for Craig to also join in. So now there's two men beating Ramis and they were still screaming at him, still shouting. So loud in fact, that this disturbed Ryan upstairs and he came downstairs to see what was going on. And once again, it really didn't take Ryan that long to join in either. So now there are three men beating, kicking, punching Ramis, who is on the floor, defenseless, bleeding. In fact, the blood actually started getting on the carpet and on the furniture and the men couldn't have that. This is an Airbnb after all. And so they grabbed Ramis, dragged him outside and threw him into the garden where he couldn't move. Like he was, he was so injured that he couldn't even stand up. And now the men knew that they could continue this attack without having to worry about making a mess. So now that they were outside, the first thing they did, Ryan came over and put Ramis in a four figure leg lock, which is like a wrestling MMA move. So this move essentially pinned Ramis down to the floor so that he couldn't move. Not that he could anyway, because he was so injured and exhausted from the beatings that were going on inside that he really couldn't defend himself anyway. But now he was pinned down to the ground by his legs, which left his head and his torso exposed so that the other two men, Craig and Jason, 
could continue the attack. So the beatings continued and continued. They were not slowing down even in the slightest. And at one point, Craig actually grabbed Ramis's phone, went over to his head, pulled his head up and put it in front so that his face ID would unlock. And then Craig went on to Ramis's banking app to check if he'd been paid yet. And no, he hadn't. It was still $6 in his bank account. And at this point, Craig Levy walks inside the house and calls the police and it's not very clear why. Some sources think that he was just calling it a day with the attack, you know, they felt like they'd done enough to hurt Ramis Januzzi and they were calling the police to end things. Although I am more inclined to believe the second possibility and that was that maybe Craig thought the police would come and help them get the money out of Ramis. It's possible that Craig thought they wouldn't get in trouble for beating him up because, well, I think the men thought that they were in the right here. They thought they had good reason to be physically beating this man because he owed them money that he wasn't gonna pay up. And so maybe Craig thought the police were gonna be on their side and they were gonna help them? So anyway, Craig is inside the house calling the police. Ryan still has Ramis in this like leg lock thing so he can't move. And Jason decided that he was gonna walk around the front of the house to where Ramis Janusi's car was parked and he was just gonna have a rummage through it. Maybe to see if there was any money in there or anything that they could steal to be able to make up this debt that Ramis owed them. Although I really don't think there was anything in his car. The only thing that Jason actually came across was like a hard shelled pencil case, like a calligraphy pen case. So he grabbed that and walked back to the garden where Ramis was still pinned to the ground. Jason walks over to him, pulls his pants down and inserts this hard shell pencil case into Ramis's anus. After that, both Ryan and Jason got off of Ramis and left him laying on the ground, exhausted and bleeding out. By now he was like falling in and out of consciousness. He kept passing out. He was, he was dying on the ground, but the men didn't care. Jason ran back into the house and quickly like took off his hoodie because it was completely covered in Ramis's blood and they knew that the police were gonna be there any minute. Police arrived literally within minutes of getting this phone call and much to the men's surprise, of course they were not on their side. They ran straight over to Ramis and they were trying to help him as best as they could, but they're police, there's only so much they can do. He really needed paramedics. So police called for the paramedics and then they had to come out. It was just even more time that Ramis was dying on the ground. And eventually when the paramedics got there, they tried to resuscitate him, but he wasn't responding. He was fully unconscious at this point. Ramis Januzzi was pronounced dead at 9.13 p.m. just over an hour after the attack began. It had been an hour that he was enduring these brutal, savage beatings from these three men. His autopsy showed that his official cause of death was from compression to the neck and blunt force trauma wounds to the head. I believe one of the men had stood on his neck at one point during this attack. And of course they'd been beating him through the whole hour. They also did a toxicology report on Ramis Januzzi's body and it found that he had modest levels of methamphetamines, amphetamines and codeine in his system, which is believed to be a big factor in his death actually. We don't know for sure how those drugs got into his system, but remember he was dependent on a lot of things. So it is very much believed that he willingly took them himself. It wasn't something that the men gave him and like forced him to have. But this cocktail of drugs that he was on means that his heart would have been under a lot of stress. And then that paired with these savage beatings that he was having, his heart gave out a lot quicker than it would have had he not been on all those drugs. So now police are there at the scene of a murder and it's very obvious to them who the killers are. Of course, it is the three men that are demanding money from the murder victim. Jason and the other men, but mainly Jason, were trying to defend themselves to police, saying that they did this in self-defense. And it was Ramis that started the fight in the first place. I'm not sure how sodomizing someone, raping someone with their own pencil case can be classed as self-defense in any stretch of the word, especially when these three men didn't have a single wound on them because Ramis couldn't even fight back through all of this. It was so clear that this was a one-sided torture 
attack. In fact, Jason Colton's exact words to police were, he started it, he hit us with a car tool. Are you a child? What do you mean he started it? This is not a playground fight. You have just murdered another human being. It was just so obvious that these three men were lying. And so then and there, police arrested all three of them on suspicion of murder. All three of them were put on trial for murder, although it seemed that they were all gonna take a manslaughter plea, but not before saying some very horrible things in court. Jason Colton stood up there in court and said, in my eyes, he deserved everything he got. He hadn't shown any respect to anyone in the house. It also came out at one point in this trial that a neighbor had heard this whole thing happening, had heard the whole murder taking place and done absolutely nothing about it. It was a woman who lived a few doors down from this Airbnb and apparently she could hear Ramis screaming out in pain. She could hear the other men as well. They could hear them grunting and like shouting at him. She heard the whole thing. This is what she said in court. She said, it was a man screaming, a man screaming at the top of his lungs. It sounded like aggressive male behavior and I wasn't going anywhere near that. Which, I understand to a degree. If you are a woman, don't. Don't go to the scene of the crime. But if you can hear that, you've got a phone, why are you not calling the police? Why are you not trying to save whoever is clearly screaming out in pain? Anyway, all three men ended up pleading guilty to manslaughter in this trial. Craig Levy was given seven and a half years, Ryan Smart was given nine years, and Jason Colton was given 13 years in prison. And that is all I have for this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. And thanks again to Word Farm Adventure for sponsoring this video. Remember, you can download the game for free on iOS and Android. All you have to do is click the link down below in the description, or you can scan the QR our code on screen right now. A huge, huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting me and helping decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the link to do so in the description or you can click the join button if you're on a desktop. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a thumbs up down below or if you wanna watch another one, I'll leave you a suggestion right here. Or you could subscribe to my channel because I post videos like this all the time. Okay, bye.